Welcome to Welcome back to my channel and welcome to the second installment of my September reading vlogs. In my previous video, I told you that this month I'm doing my recaps vlog style because I'm planning to read a lot in this month and I want to tell you about the books that I'm reading while I'm still experiencing the reading. So I want to share my reading experience with you. And so in each video, I'm going to recap the last three books that I read and share some snippets from my life. So you'll see how it is while I'm reading and what my thoughts are pretty soon after I finish reading the book. So I can give you my most significant and relevant impressions based on just having read the book. Stay tuned for the next three books in my September reading. Isn't this just the most beautiful book cover you've ever seen? In the early 1800s, a young boy is born in a Barbadian sugar plantation and he receives a name that is bigger than his station in life. He's called George Washington, after the president of the newly freed United States, even though he himself is enslaved. But lest he think himself above his station in life, a third name is tacked on, a name that matches the color of his skin and ergo the limitations of his life. So he's called George Washington Black. Washington Black is a novel written by Essie Odugian and it's been nominated for the 2018 Man Booker Prize. It tells a story of young George Washington's life and whether we call him George Washington or Washington or Mr. Black, it tells a story of his attempts to escape his life of enslavement and what that life was before his escape and whether or not with a name like Black, whether he can escape his circumstances. George Washington Black is his name and while he's still a child, he loses his mother and with that, any hope of family. That is until he meets Big Kit who, although she is herself enslaved, she becomes a mother figure for him and she dreams of returning to her homeland of Dahomey and bringing young Washington with her. Eventually, however, the young boy becomes a pawn between two white men and their family complications tease him with freedom if he follows one even though he legally belongs to the other. And so this story is one of paradoxes, a real flight versus a flight of fancy. The burns that he receives on his face that permanently scar him when he's trying to save someone versus the burning in his heart in his quest for freedom. The plot surrounds young Washington being invited to help his master's brother work on this cloud cutter, which is some flying contraption that allows them to leave Barbados and eventually go to some other place. Here are some thoughts that I had while I was reading the book. On page 14, we read where the main character meets Titch. Titch is the man who he's gonna be helping to navigate this flying contraption. Titch is the brother of the man who owns him and Titch has designed this flying contraption that he calls a cloud cutter, which in Barbadian dialect, a cutter is a sandwich. So literally translated then, a cloud cutter should be a cloud between two pieces of bread. <laughs> But it could also refer to Washington being sandwiched between these two white men, these two brothers, Titch and Erasmus. I thought that that was a really clever way of calling this, if you understand what cutter means in Barbadian dialect. One of the issues that I had with this book is that Washington, even while he's a slave, he doesn't speak like a slave. His conversation pushes the boundary of the limitations that you expect from his life. His voice sounds so unlike that of any enslaved person that I've ever read in any other novel. Except I think that that might have been the point. And this is a story that you kind of want to go into blind and experience it the way Washington was living it. My thoughts on the book. While I was reading it, I felt like I could pick out a hundred flaws in the writing and in the execution of the concepts that I thought were brilliant in their idea phase, but that I felt like I could pick apart Odugian's writing and find all these errors. I felt, oh, this is not a perfect book. But then I realized that I started to love it. And I think this is what happens when you fall in love. You meet someone and they're not perfect and you can see flaws and in your meeting them, you can, you know, the way they pronounce a word or the way they stand or the way they do something with their fingers when you're talking to them. They're not perfect, but in your experience of them, one day you realize that you're in love. This is what happened with me with this book. I felt like I could name a hundred errors, a hundred flaws, except some of those flaws were probably deliberate. Edugen is a way more accomplished writer than I am. So who am I to criticize her writing? But in reading the prose, I realized that some of the things that I probably would have called mistakes were deliberate. It was intentional that this young man with this big name would rise above his station, even in his speech, even in his interaction that should be limited, he would feel no limit. Just as his namesake refused to be limited by 
anything else. George Washington was a pioneer. He was the first president of this great country. Washington Black, similarly, he was the first to do what he did. I didn't like the obsessive focus on characters that had long disappeared from the pages, except I understand that a man without a history, a man without any ties to his past, would obsessively look to reconnect with the people from his past. So what felt like it was an error, I realized, was probably deliberate. This is probably the reality of people in that time, people who had escaped, people who had left slavery behind. And because this young boy is born in the early 1800s, he would be alive at the time of emancipation. And so we get to see the difference, we get to see the change of society through his experiences. And I felt like the author foreshadowed that really well in the early parts of the book where Washington was not limited by his enslavement because he's one of those who would experience a change in social structure. So similarly, other things that I thought were flaws while I was reading, on completing the book and giving my overall perspective, I felt like they were deliberate and in that the author was probably really brilliant in encompassing and incorporating some of those things and challenging my understanding of her use of those writing techniques. And so I'm giving this a high rating. I'm not sure that it is a five star book, but I loved it. This is one that I think I could have a conversation about, like I'm having a conversation with you. I'm reading From a Low and Quiet Sea by Donald Ryan. This is one of the books that was long listed for the Man Booker Prize. And it's told in three parts. So I just finished the first part. And I'm gonna tell you about it. There are three main characters and this first main character, his name is Farouk and he's living in a Middle Eastern country. I'm not sure that it's named during the book, but in the synopsis, it says it's Syria. Anyway, he's living in this country and there's this constant threat of violence where you see violence being inflicted on other people and you're just never sure how long before it makes its way to you. There's a line where his wife calls the place and the life that they have um, just waiting, waiting for things to happen. Eventually, however, Farouk decides not to wait for the violence to come to him and so he books a passage for him and his wife and daughter to leave on a boat and go make a different life, a better life in some other country. And the story is about that experience and the sacrifices that they have to make in order to get that new life. Sacrifices that I don't think if they knew they were going to have to make that they would have made that decision. There's a lot to love about the writing quality. However, just like on the cover where we see this picture and their blurry edges, in this story about Farouk and his family, you see things happening but there's not as much clarity as you'd probably be able to say. You can get crisp images of what's happening. A lot of what is happening is Farouk's description in these really long sentences that give you an idea of what is happening without you actually knowing everything that's happening. I loved it. I love the story, even if it didn't feel real at all points. So now I'm moving on to the story of Lampy and I'll check in again later. Initial low and quiet sea, and while I enjoy the individual stories, I found the connections are pretty weak, and so I'm giving it four stars. And that's my train. The second story is a really odd narrative in that it follows this young man nicknamed Lampy. And he's defined by his relationship with his mother and his grandfather, as well as a failed romance with one girlfriend who he tries to replace using physical gratification with another woman. And through his grandfather's crass jokes and his mother's attempt to conceal his father's true identity. We see how Lampy is protected, but also how he's going to grow up kind of as a victim. In this second section, the author continues to explore the derogatory way that strangers are treated. So not just immigrants, but even those who are from the same society, but are considered to be different, the way they are spoken of and the way they're treated. The final character, John, seems to be the one who's the most hidden, even though he's revealing so much of himself. In this third narrative, John is a hero slash villain, and the story is told kind of as a biblical adaptation of the Ten Commandments, where John is confessing how he's broken every single one of those tenets. And through his revelations, he's telling us about his life, um, his past, but also his present. And it's only after these three main characters are introduced in their separate stories that we see how their lives intersect, what these three characters have to do with each other, and also how their lives illustrate the theme that Ryan was probably going for, which is how the world treats strangers, 
and how we relate to people who are different from us. This usually happens when I read books by Irish authors. I feel like I learn a lot of vocabulary words because these Irish writers, they seem to use words that I've never heard before. Like one of the words that the author introduced to me and that is really profound in understanding the meaning of this book is the word sliotar. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's S-L-I-O-T-A-R and apparently it's the ball that's used in the game hurling and it's a spherical ball which is composed of cork with two separate pieces of leather stitched together across it and i think this book could even have been named sliotar because there is one story and there are these two other separate pieces that are stitched together over it to form this ball that could be used to hurl into almost every part of society. I thought this book was pretty brilliant in its concept. However, the failure for me in the end was I thought the connections of the three main characters was a little bit weak. I'm giving this book four stars because one, I thought the stories encouraged profound thoughts on a multiplicity of topics. Two, I liked Ryan's comparisons of the role of men in various levels of society, but also in different cultures, and the way he looked at the relationship between men and their sons, or men and their grandsons, as well as male friends interacting with each other. Three, literary comparisons and biblical retellings always hit a mark with me, and the author used fairy tales and fables and biblical stories to illustrate the points that he was introducing, and I absolutely enjoy reading that when I see it. And four, I like the diverse connections between the stories. However, I did take a star away because I didn't feel like the treatment of any one particular topic was complete, and I thought that the connections between the characters in the end could have been illustrated a little bit stronger throughout the novel which seems like a contradiction, but it's not. And you will see why when you read the book yourself, which I totally encourage. This book was long listed for the Man Booker Prize and I'm a little surprised that it didn't make the short list because I think that there's really good quality of writing in this book, but I guess there were other books that were better and I haven't read all the shortlisted books yet so we'll see when I get to all of those so that is From a Low and Quiet Sea by Donald Ryan this is a pretty short book it's only a hundred and seventy something pages it's funny because I don't know exactly how many pages I'm gonna have to count them because you know when a chapter starts there's no page number on that chapter sometimes and the final six or so pages are all individual chapters which are just can you see it just this is a chapter <laughs> and this is a chapter so this is also a chapter and so it's about 180 pages and it's a beautiful small paperback I got this one from the library so I'm gonna be returning it pretty soon and this is a book that I'd probably want to the own next myself book that I'm reading is go went gone by Jenny Erpenbeck that's this one right here I'm making notes and I should have something to tell you about it pretty soon. On Goodreads, the synopsis says, the novel tells the tale of Richard, a retired classics professor who lives in Berlin. His wife has died and he lives a routine existence until one day he spies some African refugees staging a hunger strike in Alexanderplatz. Curiosity turns to compassion and an inner transformation as he visits their shelter, interviews them and becomes embroiled in their harrowing fate. I can't share everything with you, but here's a note that I made where the refugees, they want to work. All they want to do in this new country is they want to work. Otherwise, they're willing to starve because they don't want handouts. But the government refuses to give them the opportunity to work and instead starts to support them. Ignore the scribbles. So here's the quote that I really wanted to share with you. The men with dark skin, they don't say who they are. They don't eat, they don't drink, they don't say who they are. They simply are. The silence of these men who would rather die than reveal their identity unites with the waiting of all these others who want their questions answered to produce a great silence in the middle of the square called Alexanderplatz in Berlin. I don't know all the history of the world, but I do know that something significant happened in Alexanderplatz in Berlin, and it has something to do with silence versus noise. How much of what is going on are we willing to accept before we actually protest, before we make a demonstration, before we make our voices heard? And I think it's so significant that these refugees have come and pushed Richard out of his comfort zone and force him to acknowledge that he has questions that he needs to ask, even as these men also are seeking to have their questions answered. Is Richard 
comfortable enough in his life to allow his questions to go unanswered what of the silence that you hear how much of it is the silence that you want to observe and how much of it is a silence that you want to change I'm loving this book guys I'm lo over the course of his life Richard has had to say goodbye to everything and everyone that was significant to him now that he's retiring from his job as a college professor he has freedom to read to write to think about all the things that he didn't have time to read and write and think about while he was pursuing his career but it's also robbed him of the influence that his career afforded him go went gone is a study by Jenny Erpenbeck on human philosophy human transition how do we transition from one state of being to another and how do we know when we've crossed over? How do we know when we're on the other side? And what is it like looking back at where we've come from? The story takes place in Germany and we see a younger Richard living a very comfortable side on one side of the Berlin Wall. So he's not one to push boundaries. And even as a teacher, we see him following in the footsteps of those who've gone before him, enjoying the freedoms of those who've sacrificed, even without even considering sometimes some of the sacrifices that were made on his behalf. So now that Richard is in the more advanced stage of his life, is he too old to exchange that mentality for one of a pioneer? This book explores that. The title of this book, Go Went Gone, is illustrated by a philosophical paper that one of Richard's students composed. It's called The Levels of Meaning from Ovid's Metamorphosis or something like that. And through that illustration and comparison, we see the characters transitioning through space and time, exchanging meaning and influence and exploring the boundaries of life. So Richard's character, in his freedom to explore the city, the new freedom that his retirement has granted him. It is compared to a swimmer who drowned in a lake that is close to where Richard lives and works. And so while Richard is now free to live and to explore any life that he wants to, here's a swimmer who's at the bottom of a lake who has died. And even in that swimmer's location, it's never completely marked because the body has not been recovered. And it's quite the illustration of the uncertainty principle where we either know where an object is or how fast it's moving we know that the swimmer's body is in the lake and so we have some kind of a boundary for it but we don't know its exact location because they haven't been able to recover the body and i think that that was such a really cool comparison for richard to be obsessing about this dead swimmer's body even while he is kind of having to adjust to this new freedom that his life now affords him. Although the author is female, much of the story is male dominated. And even in this story, we have at its center, in the center of the town and in the center of the novel, 10 male refugees who have arrived and determined that they will be seen. And their entire existence is reduced to three words on a placard. We become visible. Which begs the question, what were they before? The description of the dark skin of these refugees is in direct contrast to the fact that other characters' skin color is never mentioned, and so black is what stands out, dark is what stands out, and so we become visible. Or are you already visible because you are different? Are you already visible because you are other? A novel that explores this subtle kind of solitary introspection is one of my favorite things to read. I love the discussion of movement immigration versus refugee and what it means for the people who've moved as well as the people around them what it's like sometimes to get comfortable within someone else's rules and start to think that they're your own principles what it's like to observe limitations at some point and start to accept them i loved this novel i loved a lot of what this novel caused me to think about. I enjoyed the solitude that the main character experienced and the endless choices that were in front of him as he struggled to find meaning for his life and ultimately what he did with that time. I was strengthened by Richard's weaknesses and for me, Richard is neither hero nor villain because he's more of a reflection of us, a reflection of our weakness as a society. And there's a passage in here where Richard acknowledges a critique of the former US president who didn't know that Africa wasn't a country. And in critiquing that person, Richard also acknowledges that he doesn't know all the names of the African states or much information about any of them. And, you know, while I feel like I know a lot about Africa, I don't know all the names of the African states or I might not be able to recall all of them if asked at any particular time. And so 
I feel like Richard is a reflection of who we are. That when we see Richard being weak, it's for us to either be enraged by his incompetence or empowered to do something to change. Not Richard, but our existence. This novel was nominated for the 2018 Man Booker International Prize and it lost out to Flights by Olga Tokerjok, which I'm reading this month for the Run Right Reads Book Club. If you haven't already gotten a copy, definitely try to get one so you can read it and we can discuss it in the first week in October. But I love translating fiction and this is one of my more recent loves and I got this one from the library as you can tell and I'm gonna be ordering a copy from book depository I also have a link to my book depository affiliate site so if you hear me talk about a book and you're interested in purchasing a copy please click the link for my book depository affiliate and buy it through my site so you can help me buy even more books that I can talk about on here so these are three books that I read recently and this is my second installment of my September reading vlog let me know if you enjoy hearing me talk more and more and more about these books I'm liking this I like the freedom to have more expansive discussion about the books then I probably would be able to if I was recapping all the books at the end of the month. So I hope you're liking it. I'm liking it. So let's talk about these three or any of the other books that I talked about recently. Let's talk about them in the comments down below. And thanks for watching this video. Until next time, happy reading. Bye.